Welcome to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast with your hosts, Mike Randall and Gus Kearns. And welcome back to the Screen the Screener Podcast. I am Mike Randall joining you where we talk all things college basketball. Going solo today, Gus and I will be back tomorrow with a full podcast covering all the myriad of great stuff that's going on in college basketball. But today we're going to have a special interview playing for you in a little bit with Eric Fawcett of PressBasketball.com. He's a college basketball writer, does a great job for them. And you may know him from his now viral wedding vows that have gone all over the country, internet and television, where he references multiple sports personalities in his wedding vows. We'll get to that in a little bit. So much to talk to you about. And Gus and I are going to get to most of it tomorrow. Creighton now 5-0, and the Paradise Jam champions. Arizona's 4-0. Wisconsin 3-1, and one, but a struggle against Tennessee today. Eric's going to talk about that as well in a little bit. Should we be concerned about Wisconsin? Yes, Oregon loses again, this time 65-61 to Georgetown, who just lost to Arkansas State. I'd like to thank all of you that emailed the podcast. You can email us at sdspodcast at gmail.com uh, and attacked me for my Oregon pick going to the Final Four. As Aaron Rodgers would say, folks, Let's relax a little bit. Still confident in them making the Final Four. We appreciate the emails, and I love the early trash talk. You know those friends, folks, that trash talk you in the first quarter of a game or the first half of a college basketball game? You know, your team is down like 15-5. They, like, text you just, "Uh uh-oh. That's what they send. That's what we're getting here. But we appreciate it. We want the strong support or the strong negative emails at sdspodcast at gmail.com. But we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Josh Jackson seems to have made an impact. If you didn't see the highlights of tonight's game for Kansas, he's been around. And Gus and I will discuss tomorrow, can UCLA possibly score less than 100 points? And what is that game going to be like on December 3rd when they play Kentucky? But today, we're going to talk to Eric Fawcett. Eric, like I said, writes for PressBasketball.com. You can find him on Twitter at efawcett, E-F-A-W-C-E-T-T-7. Uh, He is from Canada born and raised in Canada, is a huge college basketball fan, specifically a Florida Gator fan. And he talks to us today and we talk about so many different great parts of the college basketball season. Things he likes, things he doesn't like. We did a little rapid reacts with him as well. Uh, Just a great, great guy. Really great writer. Enjoy reading him on PressBasketball.com. Shared a story with me before we began. I asked him when he first started getting in Uh, interested in college basketball and he told the story which was great about how in Canada uh, they when he was younger when he's about 12 years old uh, they used to only get SEC games on the uh, TV and he was really shocked as a young Canadian boy at the uh, I say volatile that's my word uh, volatility of the coaches on the sideline and so he felt like Billy Donovan when he was at Florida had sort of like a nice, you know, Canadian-like demeanor. And so he started following it through through Florida basketball there on TV. So it's fascinating how people get into college basketball. I I remember mine was watching Villanova Georgetown in 85, and my dad made me go to bed early uh, and promised. And when I woke up, he would let me know right away who won that Villanova Georgetown game. And I remember coming out of my bedroom as an 11-year-old boy, and there's toilet paper hanging outside of my door from the ceiling with just V's on it. So uh, it's always odd, right, how we we start our passion and our love for college basketball. uh, And I can relate to Eric's story, Billy Donovan. And so now he's a Gators fan. Uh, So we're going to play it for you right now. Eric took a few moments to join join us. He's going to talk about college basketball. And don't worry, folks, we do get into his wedding vows at the end. And he was kind enough to give us the first interview with him. So here is Eric Fawcett, college basketball writer for PressBasketball.com. Folks, we have an extremely special guest with us today on Screen the Screener podcast. We are fortunate to get Eric Fawcett from PressBasketball.com. He writes for them, lives in Canada, huge college basketball fan. Eric, welcome to the Screen the Screener podcast. Thanks for coming on. Oh, Mike, thanks so much for having me. Uh, So, Eric, we have so much to talk to you about. Uh, Our listeners, of course, probably know you from your wedding vow fame that has been going all (laughs) over 
everything Yahoo, Bleacher Report, ESPN, uh, and how you clearly have a tremendously understanding wife. But why, why don't we start <laughs> by getting into college basketball season? Um, Gus and I have been talking about how exciting this has been, how incredible it's been. What do you think about the start to the season so far? Yeah, I think I don't think we could really ask for anything more um, uh, to see kind of the upsets we've seen to seeing the to see the players that we expected to be great play great. Um, it's it's really kind of followed all the storylines just like we would love to see them. So I can't imagine a better start to the season. Yeah, they've done a great job, I think, of getting some big time matchups. Right. I, I think the college basketball has struggled where some of your big name teams don't want to go on the road. They want to play some of your easier games early on. And Gus and I were talking about how great it is that Roy Williams. I mean, last year he went to Northern Iowa and lost. That obviously had no effect on their season since they were in the finals. Um, and this year, you know, this year he played Tulane. He went out to Hawaii. Uh, we like when these big teams challenge themselves, right, and, and give us fans something to watch. Absolutely. I mean, you want games in November to matter, just like games in February. And it's really good for the, you know, for the product on the whole because – uh, we, you know, we don't, we don't, we know that there's more than the Power Five conferences in college basketball, and there's a lot of quality past that. And uh, we want those big schools in the Power Five to uh, to schedule aggressively and have some of these great mid majors given opportunity to show off their talent. So yeah, um, to see to see how t- different teams have scheduled and to see which uh, which kind of games have gotten national television, just a really good job all around. To- totally agree. And so let, let's start with uh, – let's give us give us three things that have impressed you um, in the season so far, things that just sort of stood out. We can talk about players or teams, things that have jumped off the page a little bit at the start of the college basketball season. So uh, to any listeners, I promise me and uh, Mike didn't talk about this, but uh, Northern Iowa, who we mentioned before, actually oh. I've, oh. Had, I've had absolutely circled. I mean to see them destroy Arizona State to uh, to start the year and then – beat Oklahoma and then play Xavier tight like um I I should I should add Mike I'm a I'm a big believer in the quality loss mm-hmm. I know that's kind of a uh, totally agree absolutely I know I know not everyone is like that but I love a quality loss and to see uh to see Northern Iowa have a quality loss to Xavier and then their next game is actually against Xavier they scheduled a home and home which yep. like we talked about it's great that Xavier would schedule a thing like that but uh yeah like I just to watch to watch Northern Iowa uh, have a quality loss like that um, was really cool. And then I looked at their schedule ahead, and they're playing San Diego State, Iowa, North Carolina, North Carolina, Wyoming. Like they're 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 the real deal, and um, I love that they were able to schedule aggressively. So Northern Iowa has really jumped off the page. Oh, I totally agree. I, you know, and, and I, I wrote an article for Last Word on Sports recently about these mid-major teams who are trying to get the mid out of their name. I mean, Northern Iowa had quite a splash last year in the tournament. I mean, you know, exciting as they come, they had a tough ending, right, with was it the 12-point lead in, in, uh, in 45 seconds, something like that. But then they jumped off the page, St. Mary's. Those are teams I agree, and I agree with you about the tough loss. You know, that that's something to be said for that. They're going to battle that Xavier team. I, I agree. It, 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 just because they lose by a point or two, if it's a good, tough game, that should play well for them in the seeding. Absolutely. And while we're talking tough uh, or uh, quality losses, I should say, Lehigh was another school that had a really quality loss to Xavier. Sure. And there's actually a friend of mine that that pointed out uh, the score kind of during during that game and made me tune in. And I ended up kind of following it afterwards to uh, to watch it. And Lehigh impressed me a ton. And they had a really good quality loss to uh, Xavier. I guess quality loss is kind of the term to use. Mm-hmm. They had a quality loss to Yale and then they beat Princeton and uh yeah, I, I've really enjoyed watching them, and, and come come February, come March, they're going to be. Uh, I'm going to have my eyes on them, and uh, especially Tim Kempton, their big is one of the mm-hmm. most polished bigs I've ever seen. And if I can be honest, I don't think I knew his name before this year, but um, right. I, I know now, and I think he might be, might be one of my favorite players in college basketball. He's just so polished playing against man in post isolations or playing the high post against the two three zone. He just he looks awesome, and I think that's a guy who deserves a lot more recognition. No, that, that's that's a great one, and of course Yale. I mean, you know, Yale. Who knows what that loss is? It, how that's going to end up being? I mean, they went out to Washington with Markel Fultz, who looks oh, like 30, 30 points per game is going to be the norm. <laughs> um, and, and they went out there and they won there. So, I mean, a lot of the, the things that you may know in the past that people think about the Ivy League. I got we have a, a real good friend of ours who's an Ivy League fan who's waiting for Ivy to get a second team in. You know, he's he's always oh. waiting for that. And this year they have the four team tournament could happen. But sure, who knows what's up with Yale? Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 
there's something about um there's something about like you know the Ivy Leagues that that you really want to pull for. Like when you mentioned you know having two teams, I like it kind of made my heart race. Like Same. Yep. the the purest in me and the purest in you and the purest in college of basketball fans just really wants to pull for uh, the Ivy League schools and any other school that's uh, very academically focused as well. Maybe not in the Ivy League, but there's there's something about high academics and athletics that like the purest in you just has to love. Yeah, I, no, definitely. And, you know, last year, you know, when when, when you follow, co- follow college basketball and you watch the tournament, I have a, a, a thought that you, if you're a fan of it, you'll know early on in the game if this is one that's going to be a tight one, right? And Yale, mm. Baylor, Middle Tennessee State, Michigan State had the same feel. You could tell right away, three minutes in, folks, let me sit down, get a beverage, get some wings, because this is going to go to the end. And, <laughs> and Yale played great, and, and, and gosh, Baylor looks great this year. So, I mean, Yale... Ivy League, we love that. We love it. It's it's tremendous. Absolutely. Um, okay, folks, we're talking to Eric Fawcett of PressBasketball.com. You can find him at E Fawcett, E F A W C E T T seven. He writes for PressBasketball.com, and he's kind enough to give us a few minutes here. Eric, let's uh, let's turn to to some things that sort of have jumped off as a concern for you so far. I'll, I'll lead you in. Uh, I've got we've gotten some emails on the podcast because I'm big on Oregon. I'm saying Oregon's going to the yes. Final Four. I'm all in. We got an email tonight already from somebody saying, "How's that Oregon Final Four pick looking?" <laughs> all right. I, yes, we understand that they just lost to Georgetown. Okay, but the, you know Dylan Brooks just returned. He had eight points. I don't know if he even started. Uh, you know, knee jerk no, reaction. Yeah, knee jerk reaction. You know, people want to, to jump all over it. And, and by the way, Eric, we love the attacks on the screen, the screen of podcast. We'll take positive or negative <laughs> emails. That's fine. But what are some things that you've seen? A couple things that you said. You know, this could be a problem for this player or this team. Yeah. Well, I mean, in defense of Oregon, first, um, I was kind of ready to defend their loss to Baylor, even though it was ugly. Like. Playing Baylor in early November is just like the last thing you want to do. Yep. The way that they play that zone defense, that's kind of this amoeba that's morphing, and you, it might, it, I think it might be the hardest defense to prepare for in, yeah. in all of college basketball. So I was ready to defend that one. Uh, t- today's is a little tougher, no question. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like like you said, uh, you're you're dealing with um, a team that their their strength is not depth, and I think a lot of times in college basketball. You're really like when people are evaluating talent on teams, they're really thinking like, what's the most deep team? And I'm like, depth is awesome. I'm not saying depth doesn't matter. It matters a lot. But um, there there are some teams that um, are are front loaded in talent and Oregon is one of those. And down in the tournament, when it comes to playing seven or eight deep on your on your bench, um, it's the teams of the top end talent that can win. So I'm not too concerned with the model that Oregon has going forward, but I will say I'm a little bit concerned. Yeah, that was that was a tough one, uh, and I agree with you about the depth. I've gotten on Sean Miller in Arizona a lot because I feel like they get into the tournament, they only go six deep. Remember, when Gabe York was coming off the bench a couple of years ago, so I do think you need depth throughout the season. Uh, yes, you know, but I, I, I'm not ready to to judge Oregon, Dana Altman, that whole crew when basically what I think is a first team All American has just returned for his first game. I, I think they'll be fine, but yeah, the Georgetown one did surprise me a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's not a loss I expected, and I mean Georgetown almost Georgetown that game and uh, let it slip. But uh, um, I, I have to also quick just make a note: uh, Rodney Pryor, the transfer from Robert Morris sure. to Georgetown, is mm-hmm. absolutely filling it up this year. Yep. And um, he was a target of of my favorite team, the Florida Gators, and I so I followed him kind of closely, and uh, I knew he was going to fill it up. But I think he. He might have went for 30 again today. I forget. If not, if not he went for the high 20s. And, uh, yeah, he's absolutely filling it up. And he's a he's a great get for Georgetown. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's kind of sad for me. Like, a lot of times I think it's quite sad to see guys leaving smaller programs for bigger programs. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it sucks to see teams lose their talent. But I also like when guys have a chance to showcase their talents. And that's what he's doing right now. So So good on him. Yeah, totally agree. What, what's it, give us one other thing that you've seen that, that concerns you right now, something that sort of, you know, you raised your eyebrows at when, when these first few games. Yeah, so, um, you know, Mike, um, I want to stay friends with you. I also might want to even uh, get on the podcast again. But, oh, uh, anytime, Eric. Something, sure. something, something you're not going to like is uh, I think Wisconsin's been really concerning to me. Oh. Um, and <laughs> and partic- go, yeah. partic- particularly your guy, Nigel Hayes, I, uh, I can't. 
he just he's not doing it for me and um it's it's kind of interesting to me that you know in uh in the day and age that uh efficiency is big people love their advanced stats a guy like nigel hayes has really gotten a pass with with a lot of people because as far as i'm concerned he's a really high usage guy who shoots the ball really poorly and looking at his numbers last year when he was before he was below 40 percent from the field below 30 percent from three um he's he's off to doing that again this year and also uh to see Bronson Koenig out there who I think is an awesome point guard I love the guy but he seems like a new player this year because it seems like he's just trying to score in isolation and I just I, I'm really curious what's going on because it just doesn't look like a Wisconsin team I was I was hoping you'd uh, you'd maybe speak to that but I'm just not seeing Wisconsin basketball from these guys so far. You know, I, I think that's a valid argument. I do. I, we love Wisconsin. We, like what they, we love what they stand for. And I, I said to Gus the other day, the only thing I'm concerned about is are we examining Wisconsin through the lens of Bo Ryan and underestimating mm. what, is a, what is a Hall of Fame coach uh, not being there? Um, are, you know, was last year just the Bo Ryan star of the year hangover? It just seems on paper – Hap is a tremendous scorer. I think he's a great third scorer. Oh, yes. You know, K- Koenig was, was hot mm. last year, hit that great shot against Xavier in the tournament. And Hayes should be a first-team All-American. But, yes, and he does fall in love with his jump shot a lot. You're totally right about that. Yeah, I think I would just kind of like to see a little more Draymond Green out of him and see yes. those field goal attempts a little bit lower and see the efficiency go up. Because at him, him at, you know, 14, 15 field goal attempts a game is is just a little high in my mind. And I'd like to see... I'd like to see him a little bit lower, see the turnovers lower, and I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think you might see a little more team success, but uh, that, that, what you mentioned about the Bo Ryan lens, that's really tough to unsee, and, and I probably need to do that, and probably a lot of people do. But uh, yeah, just um, I, I do find them concerning. I don't think Tennessee is a very good team, and uh, they, uh, they, they kind of hung with Wisconsin for a long time uh, this afternoon. So I'll be, uh, I'll be interested to see what they have kind of moving forward. And I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that phrase. I think all of us in our life need a little more Draymond Green. Okay, I, I'm gonna use that one. That's yeah. tremendous. Oh my goodness! I think some people might need a little bit less, but a lot of us need a lot more. You know? <laughs> yeah, my wife may think I need a little bit less Draymond Green, but that's fine. Uh, let, you, you mentioned the Gators. They're your team, your Florida Gators. Let's head over to the SEC, right? Because you know, certainly to the average college basketball fan, they're going to say it's Kentucky and the rest. So why don't you give us a little preview into the SEC, some other teams that have gone under the radar, and of course, please throw in what Coach Calipari in Kentucky is going to do this year, in your opinion. Yeah, well, we might as well just start off with Kentucky. Um, I I don't think we need to talk too much about Kentucky. Uh, me and Mike don't have to. We'll get You'll get that a lot of other places, but uh yeah, they're what I what I really like is they're going to defend at a high level, and um, just uh, I think I think a problem when you have so many first year guys is shooting always seems to be a problem. Shooting seems to be something that guys get better with experience, and uh, you know Monk can really shoot the ball, but oh, other than that, jump Lord. shooting might be a question for them. But I'll just I'll leave it there. We we don't need to talk too much Kentucky. They'll uh, they'll defend at a high level, and uh, they'll factor in big in a in a late tournament run in March. But uh, yeah, I. I should uh, I should mention the Gators for sure. Um, I might be uh, being a homer a little bit as a Gator fan, but I, I do think they're the second best team in the SEC. I think they have all the length and athleticism you need to defend at a high level, and I think they won the jackpot when they got Canyon Berry to transfer, absolutely. who is uh, yep. absolutely a treat to watch if you haven't, um, because if nothing else, you'll see him go to the foul line and shoot free throws underhanded just like his dad. <laughs> so, exactly. it, was actually, it was actually funny because I tweeted out um, video of his first free throws of the season where he shot them underhanded, and I mentioned that he uh, he shoots them like his dad, and um, a lot of people tweeted back, and they were like, "Oh, you mean like his grandfather?" And it was, uh, it's no, it's it is actually his dad. So uh, it means Danny we're getting so old, think, my friend. That's what that means. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, to get to get a guy like that, um, to uh, you know, a graduate transfer like him was is huge for a team that really defended but didn't shoot well. To get a score like that is big. Um, after that, I, I mean, we discussed it. I, I think it's murky in the SEC. It's, it's hard to tell who's up there. But um, I think when it's murky and you don't really know who the best teams are, it's a, g- a good place to start is just who are the best players. And uh, one of the best players, I think, in the SEC is Luke Cornett at Vanderbilt. Yep. Mm-hmm. He's, a, he's a legit pro prospect. Um, he's not going to really fill it up at the, at the college level, but he's a seven-footer who really shoots the three well and block shots. And I think that's what the NBA looks for in their – 
in their five men. They want someone who will protect the rim and then step back and knock down a three. So Luke Cornett is someone to watch for. And uh, how about uh, how about Moses Kingsley? He's uh, he's oh, at Arkansas, one. and my goodness, he might be the most lonely guy in college basketball because that's not a great roster, but he's a legit back-to-the-basket big who uh, kind of plays that old-school game, but he'll be uh, he'll be in the mix to average a double-double. And um, I know it's kind of fun to predict those guys because there's not a ton of double-double guys in college basketball, but he might be one. So he's another big to keep the eye on. But, uh, yeah, the SEC uh, – they need to make hay in, in the non-conference schedule. There's no doubt about it. They need to get some wins to get some credibility behind their names. Because right now, people are talking to, the SEC might be a two-bid league, which, I mean, is tough to argue against. But it's it's kind of a mantra that needs to be shifted by the SEC. So I'm hoping they make some, make some hay in non-conference. Uh, and uh, by the time conference comes and everyone's beating each other up, that their RPIs and their strength of schedule and just general reputation will be a lot better. Oh, that's great. And I love the Kingsley call down with Mike Anderson in, in Arkansas, you know, bringing that up-tempo style. That, that's a good one, a 6'10", 230 guy uh, running the floor. <laughs> but I, I, I agree. And, and it's still the SEC in my mind. I understand what you're saying. It may be a little bit down, but to me it's still the SEC. They have that sort of, you know, sort of, of reputation that at any moment those, those teams could get hot. And if they get in the tournament, you don't want to play an SEC team. So I agree. Yeah, and uh... – like I said, they really need to make make hay here while while the sun shines in the non conference. But one thing that uh, the SEC did that was really brilliant for the league, or it's it's looking brilliant, was a couple of years back when they scheduled the Big Twelve SEC Challenge. So right smack dab in the middle of the conference schedule, um, the top eight teams from both leagues get to play play each other. So you know the SEC team plays a Big Twelve team. So it's kind of a really nice boost in the middle of the conference schedule if the conference RPI is kind of low to get a chance for the sec to play a bunch of big 12 schools and have a chance to get another quality win so um it didn't it didn't work for us last year where i think it was maybe six and two in favor of the big 12 yep. but mm-hmm. uh but um yeah it's it'll it'll hopefully do well in our favor since the big 12 is not as strong as it used to be so it might be a chance for the sec to kind of get the reputation up yeah, well, well said. We're talking to Eric Fawcett uh, from PressBasketball.com, and, and we've had a chance to read some of his articles. does a great job there on a, on a fantastic site. Um, Eric, one of the articles I really liked that you wrote about was, I think it was in October, mid-major players. Uh, you covered oh, yeah. it for your article about small school players that you know really aren't getting enough coverage that people don't realize. Uh, why don't you give us a couple there, a couple of those mid-major stars that, you know, if you, unless you're the vagabond junkies, like we like to say, uh, you know, people may not know about. Yeah, well, the good thing about these mid-major guys is they're they're already kind of making their names up. Like, for example, um, you discussed them on your podcast as well a few times. You were on them early, but E.C. Matthews is almost oh. a household name now. Yep. And if you talk to, you know, at the end of last year or even a couple months ago, E.C. Matthews at Rhode Island would, would be another one of those guys that you might not hear their names until March. But uh, he's uh, he's really put his, you know, as, as Rhode Island has been good and he's been great personally, he's had a lot of success. He's kind of gotten on guys' radars and it's it's kind of funny like that to uh, to talk about guys that are that are kind of mid majors that break that title in their on their own. So he's one of the, he's one of the guys I wrote about that. It's almost funny to look at him in in that sense now. Yep. It almost makes my article look obsolete because he's he's in the public light now, which is awesome. You're a soothsayer. And, uh, You're a soothsayer is what you are. You on him before he <laughs> even got hot. You know before they had a massive comeback against Cincinnati where they were dead to rights in a lot of ways, and then he got hot and they got hot and, and tore it up in the last game. It's a dangerous thing when a team has that much length and guys who can get hot and fill it up offensively. That is oh, yeah. that is a recipe for success mm-hmm. in college basketball. Yeah. Um, and I think I think the favorite, my favorite player that I wrote about is uh, Cam Oliver at Nevada. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I still, you know, you know, Mike, I still have a, have a little place in my heart for kind of old school basketball. And I still like kind of the traditional power forward who's six foot eight, who's 240. He, you know, he wants to play with his back to the basket. And yep. that's kind of what's, that's kind of what Cam Oliver is. He has kind of the Kenneth Freed motor, but uh, he's, he's kind of, he's built like an old school power forward and kind of plays like that. So Cam Oliver is a guy that, uh, that I spotlighted, was really happy to, to see. And uh, I think he's a guy who's on a Nevada team that um, you're probably not going to hear too much about. So you might have to go out of your way to make sure you see some Cam Oliver coverage, but uh He's one of my favorite mid-majors. 
that I'm looking forward to making the leap to the NBA, as I think he will. Yeah, agreed. He, and high motor guys, I, I always think, Eric, that, that's that's a skill. Okay, enough of this, you know, you work hard and that's assumed. No, it's a skill to work that hard. And the back-to-the-basket guys are making a comeback. I mean, just look at Purdue mm-hmm. with Haas oh, and yeah. Swanigan. I mean, I was looking at them. <laughs> I, you know, we had seen, seen them last year, but I'm looking at, wow, they are huge. And so the... I feel like, you know, the pendulum goes one way, goes the other. Obviously, now the guard set and Villanova didn't win that game as a nice win in Purdue. But now the back to the basket guys are going to start making a comeback. And, and Cam Al- Oliver is a great call in Nevada. Well done. Yeah, well, I mean, I know we're talking college basketball and not the NBA, but if you look at the NBA draft from last year, there was a whole lot of big, big players taken in the in the lottery. And I think that'll obviously, when you get that talent of that size in the NBA, it's going to shift um, it's going to kind of shift the style of play there. But uh, in college basketball, we've seen that defense and rebounding is still king. And you need size and you need length and you need physicality to do that. So I think in college basketball, the uh, you know size is going to always matter. All right. I, I agree. Well, listen, my friend, thank you for giving us a few minutes before we get you out of here. And before, of course, we get to the story of your wedding vows. Uh, we'd like to play a little rapid reacts with you. Uh, so what I'm going right. to do is I'll set the clock here for 30 seconds, and I'm just going to shout some names out at you. Um, and you give me the first thing that comes to mind when I say them. Can be good, can be bad, can be a word or a couple words, and let's see how many we can uh, we can get in here in rapid reacts. Eric, you ready? All right. This is going to be fun. Let's do it. All right. Let's check it out. Here we go. Uh, let's go with Ivan Rab of Cal. Uh, intriguing. Uh, Trevon Blewett, Xavier. Verse, versatile. Uh, Caleb Swanigan, Purdue. Oh, he's a beast. Connor Frankamp of Wichita State. Confusing. Too many games, he gets zero points. <laughs> Good. Frank <laughs> Mason the third. A screen the screener favorite, Kansas. Oh, he's a leader. Jared Blossom, game of Clemson. He's gritty. Markel Fultz of Washington. He is electric. And Lonzo Ball of UCLA. He is an entertainer. Yeah, and are they gonna are they gonna score? By the way, uh, under a hundred points this year at UCLA. I mean, is that, is that I, I, cer- I certainly hope not. I honestly, I hope even if they lose, I hope they lose one hundred and one to hundred. Because yeah, yeah, absolutely. they're they, they've they're, been they're so exciting. I hope I hope they're able to press for forty minutes and uh, and get lots of shots up. Because uh, yeah, I, UCLA hasn't had the success that many have thought in the last few years. So. Uh, I hope they have success, but I hope they bring that brand of basketball. Super exciting. All right. So now let, let's get to what people want to hear about. So, folks, again, it's it's Eric Fawcett, E-F-A-W-C-E-T-T-7, uh, writes for Press Basketball. But recently, Eric posted his wedding vows. Congratulations, Eric, on, on getting married, first of all. Thank we, you, sir. We, we assume you're still married at this point. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I am, yes, still happily married. <laughs> uh, and Eric, had, why don't you give us the background on how you came about this, tell people about the wedding vows, uh, and what your wife's reaction was to having your vows said at your wedding uh, with all sports references. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I got married to a girl who very luckily for me loves sports, and uh, that really makes it a lot easier as a sports fan to marry someone who, who loves the same thing you do. But uh, anyways, uh, I mean, I think as a guy, sometimes you can struggle to share your emotions in a way that uh, it's, it can be kind of tough to communicate sometimes. And uh, just kind of as I thought about it, I thought like, you know what, the best way I can kind of share my love and my, my wishes for my what my, I want my marriage to look like with, uh, like, I might as well use sports references. So I ended up writing these uh, these wedding vows that are full of sports references, and uh, I, know, I I was pretty sure that she was going to appreciate them, um, which was a little nerve wracking. But uh, no, in the end, in the end, she really loved them, and uh, yeah, I, I hope you guys can take a look uh, seeing them. But uh, that's kind of how they came about. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a super kind of like planned thing necessarily. I, I wasn't thinking to myself, "Hey, I'm going to put these up on the internet and hope I can get on ESPN." But uh, it ended up working that way. So, uh, yeah, that's that was very cool to see my face on ESPN, even if it was uh, you know in <laughs> getting made fun of a little bit by some people. It was still cool. But uh, yeah. Oh, it was so awesome. And folks, if you haven't seen it, all you have to do is Google Eric Fawcett wedding vows. I mean, pick a site that it pops up at. But <laughs> uh, so well, so she received well. She was smiling the whole time. I mean, she seemed to enjoy it. But that is, she's a very, very cool life. I want to compliment yeah. her. And, oh. and that's fantastic. I mean, I, so her reaction was good. 
Yeah, it was. I have to just tell you one more story too, just talking about how how I found the perfect girl because uh so we actually we actually got married in August, even though I just got the video recently and that's why I, I was I put it out there. But uh yeah, we actually got married in August, but uh we didn't go on a honeymoon. And the reason we didn't go on a honeymoon was because we both were thinking like, you know, traveling's expensive. Um a honeymoon is something we want to make sure we really do what we what we love. And uh, the thing about getting married in August is there's not college basketball in August. <laughs> so we actually <laughs> did, didn't go on a honeymoon so that uh, we actually kind of just saved a little bit of money. And uh, in January, we, we we're going to head to Gainesville to University of Florida and watch some college basketball there. So if, uh, uh, that's great. if, you, know, if you didn't think my wife was, was awesome already, um, she delayed her honeymoon so that we could watch sports. And um, <laughs> Wow. That, There's a lot, a lot of women that would do that. So uh, That's true love, Eric. <laughs> There's no doubt about that, my friend. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's a part of the story that I, I think would pair really well with the vows, but I haven't really been able to tell yet because people just see the video. So I'm glad to share that with you, that uh, not only were all the references sports vows, that our, our honeymoon was delayed by five months so that we could go watch college basketball. Great. So when is it scheduled? Uh, we're going in January. Um It'll, we'll, uh, which is cool because uh, Florida is getting a uh, University of Florida is getting a new uh, new stadium. Then, so uh, we'll be we'll be there for the second game. We're going to see Ole Miss. Um, we'll also see them against Tennessee, and then we're going to see them against Georgia. And we'll fill the gaps in between with Day at the Beach and uh, yeah. probably do Disney as well. But uh, oh, yeah, the, I mean, we we kind of planned it around going to a couple games. So uh, yeah. We're really excited to do that because, as as Mike mentioned, uh, I live in Canada. I'm a Canadian. I live in northwestern Canada, so uh, it really, uh, you know, I don't get to consume college basketball in, in person very often. So uh, it's kind of cool to to um, you know do a do a honeymoon around sports because it's you know I love my wife. We love sports together. Um, you know, we love college basketball. So it's it's a great way to do it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, Eric. Thank you so much for coming on the Screen the Screener podcast. Best of luck to you. You can find him, folks, at PressBasketball.com, on Twitter at EFAWCETT, E-F-A-W-C-E-T-T-7. Uh, check him out. Best of luck uh, with the wedding. Best of luck. The honeymoon is fantastic. Congratulations. Uh, we will definitely have you on again, uh, my friend. This has been been great, and, and we love to share our, our passion for college basketball. Oh, uh, Thank you so much for having me, and, uh, yeah, I hope I can come on again. But thank you so much for having me. Great, Eric. Thanks so much. All right. Bye now. And so that's it. Thanks, Eric, for coming on so much. Boy, that was a lot of stuff we gave you there, huh? Eric was all over it. Rapid reacts. He didn't even blink when I threw in Connor Frank Camp. I mean, you know, you follow this show, you know what we think. But, man, he's got it down pat. Uh, Definitely check him out at PressBasketball.com. Really good insight. Knows a lot about the game. You know, big teams, small teams. Um, Really enjoyed having Eric Fawcett on. So, Eric, thanks so much. We will definitely get you back on later in the year. Uh, So that's it for today, folks. That's our interview. Gave you a preview. Going to come back tomorrow with Gus. We're going to cover all the action that's going on. So many big games, so many questions, so many things to celebrate. College basketball. We haven't even hit December yet, and we're flying high. Boy, I can't wait for March. Again, check us out on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio. You can email the show at sdspodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter. SDS Podcast on Twitter is our handle. Uh, Thanks so much for listening, folks. We're excited. College basketball season's rolling. We're ready to go. Gus and I, back tomorrow, 24 hours. We'll see you. Screen the Screener Podcast.